Uh, next up is George Church. He's the professor of genetics at HMS um, and the director of the personalgenomes.org, which is a database that provides the world's only open access information on human genomic, environmental, and trait data. He's a pioneer in genome sequencing, and it's really exciting to note that George's work led to the first commercial genome sequence in 1994. He's got lots of exciting things to talk to us about, but this evening he's going to share an intriguing topic with us, genetic superpowers, changing your genome and environment. Please welcome George Church. So this is, uh, this is my uh, thank you slide and my conflict of interest slide. I'm very grateful for these. My biggest uh, conflict of interest, of course, my wife, who's uh, uh, not only a top-rate, uh, cutting-edge research geneticist uh, tenured professor at Harvard, but also has this impact worldwide uh, by helping to educate. And you'll see as I go forward, there's a lot of education to be done, and she handles it from high school all the way through physicians. And if you get interested, go to pged.org, and you can put a real red dot on your favorite part of the world by answering some questions. Now, this. The part of the reason we need this education so urgently is that the, that the uh, landscape has changed so quickly. It was on a Moore's Law curve, this kind of this dotted exponential, you know, the, the way that computers are changing exponentially, and it dropped off that curve in a very delightful way so that the $3 billion genome came down to roughly a $1,000 wholesale genome today, not in six decades, which we would have predicted if it went at the high rate of computers, but in six years. And, uh, and we're barely ready for it. But part of being ready for it is, is our ability to share um, among researchers and, and the world uh, the information about our genes, environments, and traits. And so we have this very special project uh, that, that uh, you've already heard about, personalgenomes.org, which is the world's only open access source for this information. And the idea is not just to predict from your genomes, you know, the exact hour of your death, but to fill in a lot of other information that will con constitute precision medicine, that will constitute this big data set about each of us instead of the very small ones that we have right now. And the million-fold improvement in, in the cost and quality is, also, is not only reflected in, the, in your inherited genome, but in your, the genomes of your microorganisms, your viruses, allergens, your immune response to them, and so on. The, um, some of the people in this project decide to become re-identified. They, 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 uh, they share their name. It's not required. And they show up for, uh, for an annual meeting where we bring together scientists, uh, engineers, clinicians, and, uh, and the volunteers. It's a unique uh, and wonderful experience every year on DNA Day. Um, and what we do for them and with them, and it's a very participatory project, is we measure everything we can imagine, and that list of things that we measure is getting larger and is highly integrative. Um, so, for example, we measure everything from their uh, genome to their stem cells. We have, um, uh, we can differentiate their stem cells into, into uh, uh, brain-like structures uh, and, and, and analyze the actual brain in the functional magnetic resonance imaging image there. So that's actually my brain there sliced through. It's, Virtual slices, fortunately not actual slices, and uh, and then those are some neurons that were derived from skin cells. So the skins turn into stem cells and then into neurons. We are we can share this because they get 100 percent on the exam. They know what they're getting into. If we have bad news to tell them, they've already pre-visualized it. Um, and in most cases, there are very few cases where there's totally nothing actionable. That's an important lesson, and I think it's a misunderstanding. It's they're even for uh, diseases, fortunately, there are no cure, there are things you can do in terms of reproductive counseling, that is to say, uh, where you can uh, free up the next generation. And, uh, and for many things, there, there is something you do, even things that are brand new where people we aren't used to it. And these are, these, this is a whole list, and I'm not only going to pick on one of them, where these individuals, um, were n regular medicine was not serving them well. And, they, and their doctor, physicians typically would uh, do something very radical, which was to sequence their genome. Uh, and then they learned uh, something uh, brand new about themselves, and sometimes brand new for the whole world. 
I'll just uh, focus on the one that's in the red box uh, there. That's John Lowerman. All, all these people, you can see their names are up there, uh, either because they're in the Personal Genome Project and decided to out themselves, or their, their family considers it so important that they shared it with, uh, with the press. Uh, anyway, they're all heroes uh, to me. John Lowerman um, wrote about this. Uh, he, he, he presented to the Personal Genome Project uh, as a healthy individual, um, but uh, uh, on inspecting his medical records, you can see he had scotomas, which are little black spots in the visual field, uh, and uh, was hospitalized for leg pain. Interestingly, usually when you, when you go in for leg pain, you don't get a genetic test, but he did. This is even before he was in the Personal Genome Project. And they picked a gene, which is kind of old practice, is you pick a gene, and they picked the wrong one, and, and he didn't have it. But then when we did the whole genome, they, they picked factor V Leiden. We, we did the whole genome and found he had a JAK2 mutation that, uh, that involved, uh, that, that explained the, these clotting uh, results. And he, so he takes aspirin. That's uh, what he's doing um, as a result. Now, the conclusion of this is not that uh, in order to live past 110 years, you should smoke and drink to excess. Uh, <laughs> The, the, what we're hoping is, uh, and this is a slightly different angle than what David Sinclair just said, is we're hoping that these people have in them highly protective alleles, something that they have the same bad environment we have, maybe slightly worse environment because their idea of, of uh, environmental risk was set a century ago. Um, but, but they have this environment and th there's something that's protecting them against all the, the, the diseases that, that uh, we succumb to normally. And so what, these are in the, pro well, in the next two years, we'll probably get hundreds of, of individuals who are uh, over 100, or in this case, 110. Um, but we have some examples for your uh, edification here of, of what I consider uh, protective alleles that, uh, th that uh, might be uh, uh, something that we, we might want to consider how we can make these benefits uh, available to everybody. Because these are rare protective alleles, not the rare deleterious alleles like the one I told about John Lowerman, but rare protective alleles. And they might, and might be as few as one example in, in the world. So this, the, these are children that, have a, um, that are unique in having a double null, meaning both copies of their gene knocked out for myostatin uh, or something in that pathway. And you can, how do you study something where there's only one? I mean, how do you get big statistics on this? Well, which one, one thing you can do is you can alter uh, animal models uh, and see if you can reproduce it, and the other is you can manipulate human uh, organs, as you'll see in a moment. And so here's three different animal models. You can see the heavy musculature you get and a de decreased uh, atherosclerosis. So that sounds pretty good. I'd like some of that. So how, what are other examples? We have, uh, in addition to this, double null in the myostatin gene, there's LRP5 alleles, which um, can make your bones much, much stronger than everybody else on the planet. So rather, osteoporosis is kind of the other end of the spectrum. And uh, they're so strong that they can have uh, issues with uh, surgery. Um, PCSK9 is something that, that, that shows that the lower your uh, LDL cholesterol, the better off you are in terms of coronary artery disease. And, and to some people's surprise, Maybe as low as zero is, is, uh, is tolerable and uh, advantageous. The CCR5 gene and the FUT2, uh, if, you get, if you knock out both copies, your mother's and your father's inheritance, you, get, um, you no longer have receptors on your cells for viruses. The viruses can't get in. So HIV uh, for one and norovirus for the other. And then there's protective genes for Alzheimer's. That, they're genes that make you more prone to Alzheimer's, and they're, and they're a, a variants that make you much, much less prone to Alzheimer's. So how do we get these out from these rare individuals who happen to be lucky in the world to the rest of us? Uh, to the, and uh, a huge change, David Sinclair just mentioned uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and, and other things that, that, that we and others have worked on, to, that enable us to engineer our genome. So our genes are no longer our destiny. Um, they never were, but now you can not only change your environment, you can change your genetics. And this is done by engineering machines, protein machines, protein plus RNA, that will go in and find a needle in a haystack. In your six billion base pairs in your genome, these can go in and find one place to sit down and cleave and destroy that gene, in this case, or, or replace it with something that you like better. 
Um, this, in this case, the CCR5 gene is the HIV receptor, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And if you have patients that are in this phase two clinical trials, meaning it's pretty far along through the work of Sangamo and, and other researchers, if you have full-blown AIDS and you take your T cells uh, out, of the, out of the body and use this molecular machine to cleave the CCR5 gene, you end up with uh, a whole population of T cells which are resistant to, to HIV and you es essentially affect a cure. And this can either be temporary or in principle it can be permanent um, in stark contrast to the failures of HIV vaccines and the great difficulties with developing drug resistance uh, within your body um, when you're using uh, pharmaceuticals. So this is uh, uh, zinc finger nu nucleases uh, as one way of engineering the genome. There are many other ways. The CRISPR-Cas9 is, is the, the most popular one uh, in our lab today. And they can be used not only to change the genome, but change the way the genome uh, operates. And these uh, are examples of turning uh, skin cells into stem cells into neurons, as I mentioned earlier. And you can get uh, electrophysiology on these. They, they behave uh, in many ways like neurons at various stages of development. And you can generalize this to many other uh, organs on chips and organ systems, lung on chip, cardiovascular, and so forth. So I just want to thank all the people that have contributed to the Personal Genome Project, in particular the people that have volunteered themselves for uh, sharing with, uh, with work researchers around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very yeah. nicely thank done. You. Um, you've really given us a lot of food for thought from a scientific standpoint, but let me ask you just a practical question, which yeah. is what should we as healthcare providers and what should we as ordinary citizens right. think about doing in terms of uh, preparing ourselves uh, to be ready to uh, leverage these advances? Right. Well, I, certainly education is a tremendous thing that everybody can do. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of these things like one day you will wake up and decide that uh, that you suddenly need a computer. You know, there was a time where we didn't have computers, now everybody carries around two or three. Uh, and the price point has gotten to the point where you need to ask, why are we not getting sequenced? Uh, that we, can, we can hide the, the information that's not actionable. Like mo much of medicine, there are, there are things that are actionable, and you put aside the things that aren't. And so of the things that are, you know, that could if, if impact your, your, uh, your health today or of your children, um, that's the question you'll have to be asking yourself, and that requires a lot of vigilance and, and looking and reading. Yeah. And if you had to describe um, a single barrier yeah. um, that you think some of your open access work oh. is going to help us oh. uh, bring down, what, what is that and um, what can we do to facilitate it? The biggest, really the biggest barrier is that uh, there's a lot of sequencing going on now, and tens of thousands of people are being sequenced in medical studies, but they're being kept in silos. And we need to know if we find a new variation, whether that, that is associated with health or, 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 or uh, disease. And there, if we could pool together all this uh, information or, or, or encourage ways of, of getting shareable data, that would greatly improve. We need to know what the healthy genes look like, the healthy variations, because otherwise, they, that you know, we won't really be able to calibrate uh, and apply it to everybody. So that, that silo uh, and locking up of data is, is really a problem. And last but not least, um, you tantalized us with that last slide okay. on the human on a chip. Ah, yes. Um, can you tell us what promise you think that holds for us? Well, so, uh, so this is uh, work from our collaborators at Wies Institute, Don Engber and Kit Parker, and, and we've used the, the Cas9 CRISPR to engineer in um, both, both gene therapies and, and, and showing that a single mutation can cause a particular disease in, in these, but you can also use it for testing new pharmaceuticals, um, not just in a generic sense, but in an individual sense. So does, is this pharmaceutical going to work for this class of, of individuals? Wow. So it's it's it's, a, it's really stuff. very exciting. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So much appreciated, George.